Welcome to the Behaviorally Live Streaming, Live Stream Series. This month, we're talking about AI and its impact on the industry. We know it is the word that is on everyone's mind these days. I'm Michelle McCory, SVP of Customer Success here at Behaviorly, and today I have the pleasure of having with me Dr. Helen Wolf, Senior Director, Global Consumer Ex Experience Insights at Colgate Palmolive. Helen, that's a mouthful. Um, as we start off, welcome aboard, first of all, but if you can just tell us maybe a little bit about your current role within the organization. Hi, Michelle. Great to see you and uh, great to be with uh, all the folks at Behaviorally. Uh, I work in the Global Insights team at uh, Colgate Palmolive. Uh, uh, where I work to join the dots across different uh, methodologies, different ways of thinking, and to really help drive people centricity within the business. So uh, I have the great privilege of trying to uh, help the business think about people first every single day, which is very important because, you know, as a CPG company and as a really global CPG company, um, you know, in fact, Colgate Palmolive has its products in more households than any other brand in the world. Um, so we have a real responsibility to think about people as we're developing those products, marketing those products, uh, thinking about the full lifestyle style and that side of things. And that's what my job is about. Very cool. And can you just tell us a little bit, I think you've already kind of went into this a little bit, but how in the global capacity do you link with different insights teams within the US and globally, Europe and Asia as well? Uh, well, uh, Colgate, we have, as I say, a very uh, global footprint uh, and uh, we're very uh, uh, matrix as an organization. Uh, so I, I talk to my, my peers, my colleagues, my friends across the business um, on a, a daily basis, uh, both to the insights teams, to marketing teams, to other stakeholders, uh, un identifying what their challenges are, particularly around the uh, communication space, uh, equity space, uh, and uh, seeing how we can, as I say, connect the dots uh, and do things in a more synchronized, uh, streamlined way wherever possible. Fantastic. Wonderful. And obviously, AI is why we're here to talk about today. So we might as well dive right in. Can you tell our audience a little bit about how you and Colgate in particular view the integration of AI with insights and in the whole market research industry in general? Right. A lot of folks are talking about AI sort of taking over the world. Um, lots of us see it as more of a compliment. But welcome. Uh, welcome the view that you have as well as Colgate's view. Well, I must admit, personally, I think I take a, a, a bit of an AI limit and I, I, I honestly quite regularly pinch myself that I'm working in the industry at this time. Uh, it really feels like something where we are watching the industry shift um, under our feet as we as we drive it uh, and in a really kind of exciting um, way. And uh, as you mentioned, I think Michelle used the word complement and I think that that's a really great way of saying things. We're not, we don't envisage this as uh, you know, AI taking over insights or that insights will become any less um, led by people. In fact, the way we frame this is how can we use these uh, emerging technologies, and I would say they're still emerging, um, to actually understand people better? And, and how do we make it so that we spend more time on the, the people side of things, um, the making better outcomes rather than on some of the uh, the more the, the, the drudgery of the work? So, yep. yeah, there is an efficiency play of it, but there's also an innovation and uh, a creativity play um, in the AI space. Uh, that's how we kind of think about it in these different uh, buckets on that front. Okay, that's wonderful. I was wondering if we could go a little bit deeper into sort of each of the buckets that you mentioned, um, perhaps starting with connecting the dots through the organization. Fantastic. Well, I mean, we all know that uh, there is a tendency, especially in large organisations, for uh, there to be a lot of insight, a lot of knowledge that is often a little siloed. Um, we do our very best. Uh, nobody wants there to be silos, but it can be really challenging. Um, and uh, we see a great opportunity for AI to help break down those silos and help us see connections between both data sources and uh, different even information sources beyond our normal uh, traditional data um, to help us identify where future opportunities are coming from. Um, it, inherently, uh, there's the ability of AI systems to uh, really interpret and map out data in a really quite different way from the way that humans do it, um, can help us identify links between sources that we otherwise would perhaps not see um, and help us map things in a way that we can then apply a human lens of interpretation over um, for op identifying opportunities from there. Right. And I think that's genius, right? That's, that's going to weave a lot of what we'll talk about today, right? But is the complement of the human with the AI, right? Because the AI may bring together all of these sources, um, but it does need, again, obviously, the human lens to tie it all together and to make sure it makes sense 
um, and that it's also something that the organization can move ahead with or, or conduct uh, moving further. So again, very complimentary. Um, fantastic. Okay, so I think there's some other buckets that you had already mentioned, right? I think around early upstream innovation work. Could you share with, uh, with us a little bit more about your thoughts on that? Absolutely. So we're, I mean, the, I think the AI uh, excitement uh, was really um, accelerated, I think was it November 2022 with the launch of um, uh, ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really the first uh, insight into this generative AI space that um, many consumers uh, got to see. And we, while, you know, as, as business, uh, like many CPGs, we've been using uh, more traditional AI, like machine learning, in a lot of our models for, frankly, decades. Like, they've been part of forecasting, yeah. they've been part of supply chain. They really are an integral part of how we've um, looked at the world. And, and they've built a lot into many of our actual insight models um, without you, without them necessarily having been at the core focus of the work. Yeah. But the, the arrival of generative AI and the way that it can create, like, truly new uh, constructions, um, that actually that generation, I guess that's where generative comes from, but uh, <laughs> generation, putting together ideas in a, in a new, unique and unpredictable fashion. Um, it is the, the use of generative AI in earlier stage work uh, where we really see the opportunity for uh, in, in creation, uh, uh, for it to improve our creative processes. Um, for us, it helps us to create prototypes, early ideas, both taking the germ of idea, making sure we don't lose the germs of ideas, yeah. uh, and then also helping to turn those germs ideas into um, more uh, fully elucidated concepts. So uh, we obviously see it as, again, a, a partner in that process, uh, doing it uh, AI solely without any human guidance or without humans in the loop, we've seen is less effective than doing them doing it together. Uh, but it's a source of experimentation for many CPG companies, and uh, it's pretty exciting to see uh, what new novel combinations, uh, even within the same session, um, the uh, AI can create for us. Uh, it also makes you really think about the nature of the process, because when you can see it kind of coming to life in front of your eyes, it makes you realize, you know, what's what makes for a good marketer and mm -hmm. what is it um, that you're looking to achieve here? And uh, how do you know what makes good for, makes, makes for good and less good? So it, it uh, turns the process into something which can be a little bit more, more um, deliberate and a little bit more thoughtful um, and also faster as well. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because it speaks a lot to, you know, in the industry, we would, we would talk test and learn, right, and, and fail fast. And I think AI just comes in and really accelerates the ability to do that, right? Because never before could you generate, I'm sure, however many prototypes and ideas that you're coming up with. And yeah, a lot of them will, you know, not make it further, but that ability to learn quickly and move forward from that um, is just super exciting. Um, I wonder if you Oh, go ahead. Sorry, the emphasis has to be on learning, though. So yeah. it it can't simply be like throwing throwing what's everything out there and seeing what sticks. How do Correct. you know what sticks means? Like we have to take the time to actually uh, think about what we're learning from each of the experiments, and it, it's something that uh, you know we really approach with our eyes open when we go into initiatives like that. It's sometimes yeah. difficult to do, um, but uh, it it by by knowing what the success factors are and what we're trying to strive towards helps us keep yeah. us on the, the, the straight and narrow. No, I think that's a really good perspective. I had a conversation with another client and we were talking about some AI and, and again, different service that we have not here to talk about that today. Um, but she was concerned, very similar to what you're saying, right, that they were going to get back these sort of red and green scores and kill everything. Um, and what I said back is, is very similar to what you brought up is this is just another tool in the toolkit to help people learn, right? We may, the, the tools, ones that you're using, ones that we have, there's so many out there, it's not meant to yay or nay. It is really meant to inform. And then there's a lot of smart people in the industry that are going to take that information and decide where it goes from there. No, that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. I also think that as we get more experience with this, we're going to get a, a little bit more of that gut instinct um, that we perhaps yeah. at the moment haven't quite yet got together as to what um, what feels right, what looks right, and how, how to go about things. Um, and I personally am excited that we're in, at this moment in time uh, on the on the verge of experiencing that transition. Yeah. No, I would say this is like such a pivotal moment in the insights industry, and it is 
Uh, it's just so exciting. I mean, personally, I've been with Behaviorly longer than many people have had jobs. And this is the most excited I am right now because it is such a pivotal point in terms of how fast and quickly can we learn, test and learn and, re- and iterate. And I think what we're going to see in a couple of years is just a totally different world out there. Again, still using humans to uh, ladder on to the learning that we're getting from AI and other such sources. But no, super, super exciting um, time to be in the industry. Um, fantastic. Anything else on that? Or I think there was a third bucket. Um, if, if you're ready to go there, you tell me. Well, I think there's a huge role uh, for AI to help uh, d- democratize uh, insights as a function um, and help us uh, as, as an industry become a bit more uh, led by data, um, more, in, more analytical in our mindset, but not losing the humanity at the, at the, at the mm-hmm. core of this. And so to, to talk first about um, democratization, like uh, often visualization is something that we do a lot in our innovation processes, trying to, um, you know, you can describe things, but once you kind of show somebody a picture, that is something that people truly get um, what you're mm-hmm. trying to say. A lot of uh, marketing concepts can only truly be brought to light through visuals. And, you know, we are a, a visual um, animal. Uh, and the... AI enabled uh, visualization tools are absolutely amazing for trying, g- giving you a starting point, um, helping people who, like myself, cannot, you know, barely draw a stick man, uh, actually get their <laughs> ideas across uh, and, and to do it in a way that allows a design teams to focus on stuff that actually really, really matters. Um, yeah. They can think about how to evoke the, um, the, the true um, brand impressions and the um, uh, semiotics that you're looking to get across without having to worry about some of the um, the, 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 the more hygienics at the, at the base yep. of this. So I think that there's a, there's a big role for, you know, democratization on that side of things, especially in an innovation process on that front. Um, I'd also say that, that uh, AI is helping us, um, you know, focus people's minds on what they need to know um, and, and interpret with the data. So it's part of our internal journey on helping everybody be more data literate um, and mm-hmm. uh, help us know and understand the crux of this. So if you if it's just seen as magic, then you're not going to know how to best use it. Right. Um, we're really encouraging people and we set up some training courses that we, uh, that the people are uh, really doing a great job of uh, thousands of people across the Colgate business have taken these courses to be familiar from the ground up on some of the principles yeah. um, and it's only really through understanding those first principles that you can see okay well this hasn't quite worked throughout the way that I wanted it to here's how we can pivot and here's how I can work best with the tools as they um, develop and grow. Yeah and that's and that's smart right because I think there's even I know when I first started getting into chat GPT and it's all about the prompt. So I think having to under, having to learn and, and have knowledge about how to use these is just going to make your life easier. And I think there's, you know, probably some natural hesitation about what is it going to do? Is it going to take my job? It's a black box. But I think the other side of it, which you mentioned, is like, no, let's embrace it. Let's learn from it. And if nothing else, it's going to make our jobs easier and make us better people um, in terms of understanding how to use it and to get better insights out of what we already have out there. Yeah, it, it's not all. It, it prompt engineering is a really good, um, obvious example because you write something differently and you can see the different outcomes. Yep. Um, I, I, I get the impression that that's probably going to become less of a core skill as um, AI UX becomes a bit more sophisticated, and you know, yep. prompt engineering as a skill becomes something that uh, is sort of woven into the systems as they're current as they're set up. Uh, but the idea that you understand how the actual um, the, the model underneath you getting to helps you understand why well maybe the outcome is different from what I expect do I still yeah. trust it do I have a sense of, of its connection to reality what bit what bits feel truly real and which bits feel closer to a hallucination um, and that's I think something that you know we are you know feeling our way through and experiencing as we uh, uh, I guess I would say play I know it's a bit more serious than that but sometimes really feels like it um, with these tools. No, and I, and I think there is a, a play factor to it, right? I think we're all kind of embracing it. And I think if you can have a little fun with it, it just makes it more enjoyable to get to learn it uh, a little bit more. I mean, the other day I was um, in 
ChatGTP has sort of the Dali and all these other sides of it. And I was uploading a couple images that I wanted to turn into cartoons. <laughs> um, long story why, that's for another day, Helen. Um, but the funny thing is, I uploaded a picture of myself and I was it was like 20 years old in this, in this and I'm well into my 40s. And it was just an interesting thing because then I said, can you make her older? And then all of a sudden I was like 80 years old. And it was an interesting dynamic just in terms of like, I was having fun with it. But yeah, there's learning the system and learning what makes sense to come out of it. This has no pertinent information to our conversation, but I just thought it was <laughs> uh, remotely fun in terms of the play factor, right? I think if we can embrace it as fun, people are more likely to to spend the time to learn it. And, and let, this, it's not often that things that we, uh, that the tools that we use in our everyday job actually impact our day-to-day -day life. Uh, in the same right. way so you know I, I, there is seems to me uh, ability to port domain expertise across the two you know the more they play with it at home surely that's yes. going to help your job and vice versa or at least that's that's what I tell myself as I spend way too many evenings um, <laughs> playing around on my phone <laughs> that you know what it works but that that's really I like what you said there right because this is something that just really impacts day-to-day -day life as well as work um, and it's interesting because we've dabbled in AI for years as well and we would go to clients and they just I don't want to say didn't want to listen to us, but it was so foreign. And it wasn't until the output of like ChatGPT like really blew up that people sort of accepted it as something and then it changed the whole conversation. So yeah, I think it's a really good way to think about, you know, the intersection of, of work and life and how one thing can sort of change the change the whole landscape. I cool. personally am inspired uh, by uh, some of the developments in, in alternate fields, like the technology that helps people uh, explore mental health using AI enabled chatbots to like guide them through um, uh, questions and mm -hmm. um, help with self reflection. I mean, that to me has clearly got um, options into survey design. So how is it yeah. if you want to, um, you know, guide a survey towards a learning, but yep. you don't have to do it in exactly the same way for every person, it can be a conversation, and you can get to a, hopefully, a, a more, uh, a, a deeper outcome, a more um, fundamental understanding um, in the way that we do with our qualitative work we aim for good qualitative to get deeper and more right. people right. how can we use AI to, to do the same oh I like that that's fantastic any other areas that you've seen um, Colgate utilize that, that you can share with us that you just found was a profound way to um, change the the learning and the insights it's funny I think that you know the unstructured data has always been uh, an unsung hero a bit in our industry but I'm always a bit clumsy you know the uh you know <laughs> I, I I started my research career in the agency side and I remember reviewing code frames and checking code frames and the uh the the, the sheer drudgery of that process but yeah. the fundamental importance of you know if you if you capture a, a theme wrong it, it can lead to an entirely mis um, misinterpretation mm -hmm. now that clearly is a very different um, situation now with generative AI where we you know it's able to take the um, the, the transcripts or even create transcripts from the files that you have and yep. then synthesize them in a, in a in a, at a bunch of di very different levels depending on how you kind of frame it up it yep. really just makes it unlocks unstructured data in a very exciting way and yep. in some ways it makes it now the you know <laughs> The, the, the first port of call in the same way that we've now been looking at social listening as a you know a way to understand the world as one of our primary um, routes uh, it's almost like making those unstructured data the place, first place you go and survey is almost the backup so yeah. that it's changed the balance of power a bit um, in the insights field uh, I'm intrigued to see whether uh, the, the the structured data and the potential connections that can be made um, through uh, greater machine learning and connection of the big data sets in that way can help us um, identify uh, opportunities differently in that way. Yeah, no, that's a really good point because I think what it also does is I don't want to call it grunt work. It sounds terrible, right? But it sort of makes um, folks in the insights industry able to spend their time on insights, right? We always talk about there's a lot of, to your point, the code frames or whatever, the fill in the blank of whatever day-to-day -day work you have to do. If machine learning or AI can help you do that, everyone is just able to put their strategic hat on and really help transform the business needs because, you know, time is spent in the right place. Absolutely. It's it's outsourcing the 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 the, the doing the grunt work to yep. computers and then freeing up time to insource the actual thinking to, yep. to us. That puts a lot of onus on us to be more strategic and onus on us to be better marketers and better understand people yep. at a fundamental level. Yep. 
Luther's get out of our own heads, get out of the, the, the brand speak and the business speak that we yep. you know default to. Um, I, I'm personally optimistic that this will help um, drive a resurgence in cultural learning as well, um, yep. because you know the understanding of uh, the, the outcomes of AIs should be framed in a cultural lens. Uh, that is, however, also a watch out is that many of the models have been built off of a very American focused yep. data set. Um, and, and speaking uh, as, as a Brit who lives in America, I can even see nuances within the same language of things that come out feeling American, even though they are written in the you know the, the same language. And that's a, a very those are very close cultures. Um, there are much further cultures that where the the models feel like they would be creating a world that does perhaps not resonate as, as closely. So again, yeah. that's something I think we need to keep in mind as we uh, look to leverage uh, these these models um, yeah. in, our, in our global lens. Well, thank you. That was a good segue because that was going to actually be one of my questions, right? We talked a lot about all of the the good and positive things that we see in terms of changing the landscape, accelerating things and testing and learning. But um, yeah, my next question was any concerns or any watch outs that you've seen. So that was a fantastic one. Anything else, Alan, that you've seen where it's kind of whether you've seen it or not, you're sort of aware of it in terms of, hey, you know, it might not be everything we need. So we should pay attention to X, Y and Z. Well, I mean, it, it's fundamentally important that we uh, approach uh, all these techniques in an ethical and responsible fashion and that we are aware of how they're using the data that they're not using personal identifiable data that we're not trying to uh, turn real humans into computer simulations of humans that's something that we are very very deliberate about avoiding and making sure that we're using data in the way that it's meant to be used um, yeah. I think it really strikes to the heart of like companies like ours, you know, that data governance, understanding the, yeah. the data that we own that on our own systems and that we're using it the right way is something that we're, we're I think, taking a greater focus on at the moment as a result of that. Um, and that not only for our own, our own internal sake, but also for the wider public, you know, there is, uh, we should all have a right to an understanding of how our own personal data is used and the privacy implications of that. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's a scary thing when I, you know, scroll through Instagram and things of that nature. And it's, you know, now showing me all sorts of cat videos because I send them to my friends and things of that nature. There was literally recently I had this discussion with my husband. I swear it showed something that I was thinking. And now I could be like exaggerating. But yeah, there's a whole sort of like big brother thing going out that, that we have to sort of be be careful of and aware of um, as well. Yeah. I'm sure we've all had that. And we, I wonder to what extent that's like, um you know recent like bias you know you're the you're you're, you're remembering the ones that, where that's happened um but yeah it, it it is disconcerting and you know that's i think a potential watch out for the marketing industry as a whole like Correct. great targeting can freak people out <laughs> This is fantastic. So one question, one of the last clo we'll close on is obviously it sounds like Colgate is very um, open to and already using AI. You mentioned, right, it's already been in there and a lot of forecasting, et cetera. Some organizations are, are not quite there yet and a little more hesitant. What recommendations would you offer to those organizations or any organization that's looking to integrate AI, but maybe on the fence about the um, usability of it? I, I guess I'd suggest that look to experiment with it in areas where uh, the risk is lower to get yourself familiar with it. So that, yeah. that is why, you know, innovation by itself, you, you're, we're not talking about like deciding whether something goes out into market on the, the validation that gives us, you know, project, projections of potential sales and that. Like that, that is something where we still want to make sure that we have a really robust understanding of the, of the world. But yeah. when you're thinking about something where there's lots of lots of opportunities, lots of the, the, the funnel is quite wide open. Um, why not um, bring AI into the loop and see if, see how it can complement your, your teams? Um, we've had some great experiences with uh, workshopping in this area, mm -hmm. um, trying to get cross-functional folks to do this in, in different ways. And not only have we learned about AI, uh, but we've also learned about our own ways of thinking and about the how how other people think almost within within our own teams yeah so I, I would definitely you know it's one of those things as well that you you can't really you've got to learn by doing to some extent yeah and getting your hands a little bit dirty but do it in a place um where you know you you have a bit of safety and a bit of um the where the risk is lower in that way
Yeah, no, that's really great advice. It's almost like we all have the end goal in mind, but we have to realize it all starts with one small step, right? So even start small and, and see where it takes you. Um, great. Any final thoughts or key takeaways? Anything we didn't cover that you wish I would have asked you that you're burning to tell our audience about AI, Colgate's role using AI or anything in the industry that you'd like to share? I just say what an exciting time we have ahead of us. I look forward to seeing where things stand in a couple of years, seeing what open questions will still remain. I'm sure there'll be plenty. Uh, and I, I think it really um, helps us focus the mind on how do we turn insight into action? So uh, what do we do with these learnings uh, once we have them? How do we make sure that we're creating uh, deliverables in the best interests of all stakeholders in both our company and, and externally? Uh, and how do we know that we're doing this for the, not just the this particular initiative, but keeping an eye on the long term as well? Um, yeah. We're a good long term company, uh, been around for 220 years. So we need to make sure that not only are we creating things that are suitable for now and thinking about things that are on this cutting edge, but also thinking about transitioning for you know, the uh, a strong and um, healthy future. Yeah, now that makes sense. Helen, Dr. Wolf, I thank you for your time, your insights, your continued partnership, and I'm going to put a schedule, a meeting on your calendar for three years from now so we can redo <laughs> this conversation and see where we stand. I look forward to so, it, I thank you so much for today.